Hello, everyone. I'm Lori Beckman, Senior Editor for Production Machining Magazine. Welcome to another Parts Cleaning Spark session. Today's session, titled Vacuum Degreasing, a safe and effective process for meeting the ever-increasing cleaning requirements for parts and precision components, is sponsored by Kaizen Corporation. Thanks for joining us. This presentation will cover the latest technology for vacuum degreasing, including chemistry and equipment developments, cleaning performance, and environmental health and safety benefits. Our presenter is Chuck Sexton, Global Product Line Manager at Kaizen, who has been in the cleaning industry since 1979. Today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. It's easy to submit questions. Simply type your question into the chat pane on your screen and we'll do our best to get to all of them. If you are not able to see the chat function, click on the full screen video icon at the bottom right of your screen. Then exit full screen to see if that fixes the problem. Today's session along with other Spark sessions will be recorded and will be available on demand through the Spark platform later for you to view at your leisure. Now let's get started. Chuck, take it away. Well, thank you, Lori, and thank you everyone for joining me today. This presentation is about vacuum degreasing. It's a technology that was developed back in the 90s in Europe, and we entered this market in oh, 2012, and it's turned out to be just an excellent cleaning process. Uh, Kaizen was mostly aqueous cleaning. Prior to that, we still probably are more than half but uh, this technology has just, just worked out great and it's been accepted widely uh, in the US since uh, in the last 15 years or so, I would say. My presentation is going to deal with these parts, parts cleaning technology trends, a little bit of background, vacuum degreasing process and benefits, uh, rust prevention, soil management, bath maintenance, and equipment at the end. So the trends, which I'm sure many of you know, since about 1985, I would say, have been a move away from uh, the chlorinated solvents, some of the, the less safe solvents that were typically used in um, open top vapor degreasers, perchloroethylene, trichloroethylene, et cetera. And as you know, some of the old ones were ozone depleters. And, and recently a uh, move away from NPB for safety issues. In fact, we used to offer NPB and have not now for about two years. Uh, move away from open uh, organic solvent systems due to VOC emissions. When I say organic solvent, I'm talking about solvents like toluene and xylene and mineral spirits where, uh, and even diesel fuel where <laughs> I've seen in the old days, a lot of uh, buckets by the screw machines where parts were being dipped. Um, move toward organic solvent closed systems. And that's what I'm talking about today in particular, the hydrocarbon and modified alcohol in these closed system vacuum degreasers where emissions are very low. Uh, move toward safe halogenated solvents and Kaizen does offer these uh, fluorocarbon based products and a continued strong usage of aqueous cleaning that, that has not dropped at all. Um, one way to look at parts cleaning is parts cleaning equals soil management. So it's really all about the soil. We're taking it off, we're taking oil, cooling off of parts, and then we're doing something with it on purpose. And the vacuum degreasing systems today really do a great job with that. Um, they're able to purify the oil from these systems. And in some cases, the oil actually gets reused in uh, the CNC machines. People who are looking to get into a, a cleaning process, a new cleaning process, there are lots of criteria. I kind of boil it down to uh, these four. Cleaning performance, you, you've got to clean the parts to meet your cleanliness specs, whatever they are, if they're particulate or residual uh, carbon, uh, visual. Compatibility with substrate. So if we're cleaning aluminum parts, you know, in the aqueous world, we can't use a high pH product that will darken the aluminum, process efficiency and environmental impact, and worker safety. And, and these last two bullet points really are what have driven these, uh, these trends for the last 20, 25 years. So in looking at a new cleaning process today, there are three main groups of chemistries. 
and there are others, but uh, these are the volume wise, these are the biggest. And I'll start with modified alcohol and hydrocarbon, which are used in the vacuum degreasing systems that I'll be talking about, aqueous cleaning and safe halogenated solvents. And there are other uh, technologies like CO2 and, and plasma, but in terms of volume, I think these are by far the three biggest. So this initially was my summary slide and I thought it would be good to uh, show it at near the beginning, the benefits of vacuum degreasing. Uh, excellent cleaning for both polar and nonpolar soils, which I'll talk about in a minute. The process is able to meet a wide range of cleanliness specs. And I underline this next one, no water required. And we're actually in these machines worldwide and in developing countries, uh, often they do not benefit from having uh, publicly owned water treatment facilities like we do here in the US. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to, uh, to, to get rid of uh, wastewater. So it's a really nice system in, in that sense, non-hazardous air pollutant solvents, uh, low VOC emission process. Uh, the hydrocarbon and modified alcohol are organic compounds. They are 100% VOC. However, the machines that these products are being uh, used in are very tight from an emission standpoint. We have, we have machines and chemistry and machines running throughout California, for example. Excellent rust prevention and protection. Efficient use of solvent. These machines are generally during the pr running process, they're continuously distilling the solvent under vacuum, just like the old open top vapor degreaser process. So you're always regenerating clean solvent and, uh, and, and pulling off of that concentrated contaminant. You have low consumption of the cleaning solvent and this is often the lowest cost process when you look at, I mean, if you compare it to aqueous cleaning, the equipment's usually a little higher priced on the front end, but the operating costs usually have a payback uh, within one to two years. I showed these, this slide because these are the kinds of parts that we're able to clean with this process. Uh, the solvents that are, that are used have very low surface tension and they're able to penetrate into very tight spaces internal threads, blind holes. Um, those of you in the cleaning who are doing cleaning know that these kinds of parts are very difficult. Uh, this is an example of parts that were cleaned in a modified alcohol chemistry and a vacuum degreaser. They're very efficient at removing chips and, and a high, high input of oil. I mean, these screw, small screw machine parts or CNC turn parts often have a very uh, high amount of oil that they bring into these uh, washers. Sometimes a little more difficult for an aqueous process to, uh, to deal with and certainly more easily done on this kind of parts in the vacuum degreasers. The application areas that we've gotten into again since we entered in about 2012, uh, our precision cleaning automotive cer is certainly the biggest market. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of applications in, in Switzerland and Germany for you know, very small watch components. We have gotten into a number of uh, medical uh, facilities, cleaning both implants, uh, insertion devices. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> our modified alcohol has been tested by several companies and it, it meets the, bi excuse me, <clears throat> the biocompatibility so, uh, cytotoxicity tests. Uh, precision optics, and certainly for uh, cleaning prior to coating, this is a good application. So this is kind of the a snapshot of a sort of basic vacuum degreasing process. Now, there are many uh, variations of this. This particular diagram shows two tanks. Some systems have one tank, some have two, some have three. So tank two holds the clean solvent for rinsing, tank one is the uh, so-called dirtier solvent for wash. There's a cleaning chamber on the left that holds uh, the parts, generally in baskets and fixtures. The still is on the right and it's continuously uh, distilling the solvent under vacuum, which is being condensed in that overhead condenser up top left. And the clean solvent is being returned back to, uh, in this case, uh, tank two. 
these systems have a water separator so you're you're continuously removing water and they have also oil oil separation so we're we're also removing uh, oil in this operation a closer look at the cleaning side um, you have tank one and tank two in this diagram uh, so you'll you'll charge the uh, cleaning tank initially from tank one as the wash and then from tank two as the rinse uh, there's a lot of automation and menus that you can program into the cleaning process you can incorporate and they normally do uh, ultrasonics spray under immersion spray in air uh, vapor degreasing which is which is used sometimes at the beginning and often at the end to help clean and do a final cleaning and drying uh, and vacuum drying uh, for those of you who have aqueous washers uh, simply put there's these are rotating basket batch washers however they're all very almost all of them very highly automated and uh, again a very nice operation for small turned parts Again, on the cleaning side, you have a wash, a rinse, and I don't show the tank here, but uh, in this, pro in this op operation, you would have a third tank that is the RP or the rust preventative. And the RP, it, it, the one that we make, and I'll show you that in a few minutes, is uh, corrosion inhibiting wax that's dissolved in, in these base solvents. And, and it's always a, a separate tank. and It's always separate from the distillation. The RP, uh, by definition, is non-volatile, so you need, need to leave a film on the parts to protect the, the parts. Uh, and we do not run it through the distillation cycle, or it would be removed uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the still. Normally, when we use an RP, we do not use a vapor degreasing step at the end, or if we do, it's a very quick step uh, because the vapor degreasing can remove some of the RP that you just applied to the parts. These machines generally run, and not all of them, but most of them between 90 and 100 millibar, or about one-tenth of an atmosphere for cleaning, and one to four millibar for drying. Uh, temperatures are typically 60 to 70 degrees C in the process chamber during cleaning, and in the still about 100 to 115 degrees C. Uh, the hydrocarbon is a little higher boiling than the modified alcohol. And these are solvents. So unlike aqueous cleaning, concentration is fixed at 100%. So Kaizen is based in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So I, I showed this slide. Uh, Popcorn Sutton was a, a distiller. It produced, produced uh, white whiskey or moonshine in, in Tennessee. Was very well known. I think CNN did a special on him a couple years ago before he passed away. <clears throat> Uh, but that's sort of the basic process that we're doing here in the distillation. I mean, we're boiling the salt, this the solvent, which has in it contaminant. The contaminant is uh, higher boiling, and so it gets separated in the still bottoms. The more volatile solvent is distilled through evaporation and gets condensed in the overhead condenser and then return uh, back to uh, tank two in this particular scenario. So you're constantly cleaning the solvent uh, by distillation. I mean, you really do have, in, in that sense, you have all the advantages of the sort of old open top vapor degreasing operations. So, so what we're able to do by pulling the, the vacuum down or the pressure, if you will, down uh, to typically 90 to 100 millibar, we're able to drop the boiling point. In this case, this chart is modified alcohol we're able to drop that from about 160, 165 at one atmosphere down to about a little bit less than 100 degrees C at these operating vacuums. And the, the, vacuum, the vacuum is very good for uh, limiting emissions and limiting exposure of the chemistry to, uh, to people. Best practices during distillation uh, is to keep the machine running. I mean, this is a cleaning process and you have to remove it Let's say you're removing oil, you have to remove the oil uh, at, at, from the system as fast as it is entering the system. There are rare situations where uh, customers will call with, uh, you know, I've got oily spots on my parts. 
I would say 98, 99% of the time. The problem is, is they're over overwhelming the machine with oil. It's an easy solution. We'll normally recommend that they run the uh, distillation overnight or on a weekend without running parts to clean the solvent up. And it, that, that almost always remedies that, uh, that issue. This is a snapshot of a typical uh, process. You can see there were two wash stages used here and a rinse um, dist and distillation at the end. The temperature in the wash stage and the rinse was 65 to 70 degrees. Uh, time was about 100 seconds on the first wash and 60 seconds on both rinses. Those are pretty typical times for the cleaning cycles in these uh, vacuum degreaser systems. And they used uh, spray under immersion and ultrasonics and full rotation. These baskets and these machines can be set to rotate 360 degrees or index or rock, if you will. Sort of, for example, 30 degrees clockwise and 30 de degrees counterclockwise. Regarding the chemistry, the two main products that are used are hydrocarbon and modified alcohol. For those of you who are chemists or, or have had some chemistry in the group, the hydrocarbons are, are molecules consisting of hydrogen and carbon. They're normally branched hydrocarbons. They're not typically straight chain as shown here. The modified alcohol are, are high molecular weight alcohols or glycol ethers. And they both have different solvency. Uh, this picture, uh, shows a good example of the water layer on bottom. Water is heavier than these solvents. And that would be the polar phase. And the nonpolar phase would be the hydrocarbon sitting on top. So the hydrocarbon cleaning solvent works very well for nonpolar contaminants. Um, not so well for, it's just like the old, again, vapor degreasing days when you're using trichloroethylene, for example, worked very well for nonpolar solvents. If you're trying to remove a water-based coolant, you might leave white spots. Modified alcohol, on the other hand, works for both. It works very well for nonpolar contaminants and very well for the vast majority of polar contaminants. And just to give you some example, polar soils or contaminants um, uh, would be water-soluble coolants, animal fats and oils, vegetable oils, synthetic oils, fingerprints, nonpolar uh, would be hydrocarbon or straight oils, lithium grease, paraffin oils, vanishing oils. I'm always careful, by the way, when I say soils, I, I, I give presentations in uh, Asia quite a lot. And when I first started doing that about 15 years ago, uh, they thought I was talking about dirt. I mean, dirt in the ground. So I started calling it contaminants. The, uh, there are two product lines, a hydrocarbon product line and modified alcohol product line. Uh, for the hydrocarbon line, there, it, it, for both, there are three different products. The base solvent uh, here is the 6381. Uh, there's also a, what we call a booster, which is a, an acid stabilizer. Uh, acid can be formed in these machines. Uh, if there is chlorinated oil, or in some cases to a lesser degree, sulfonated oils present. Uh, this is not like the old solvents like NPB or trichloroethylene. The solvent by itself will not make acid in the presence of heat and moisture, but the chlorine that comes in with some chlorinated oils can. So we do have a product to counter that. It's very easy and it works very well. And then we have a corrosion inhibitor for each of these two product lines. Uh, for the hydrocarbon, we call this CP81. And for the modified alcohol product line, the solvent, which is 6386. Booster 86 is uh, similar to the acid stabilizer we use in the hydrocarbon uh, and CP86. And for our CP products, we, we use rust preventative or corrosion preventative uh, wax materials, and they are dissolved in the, the base solvent. So for the modified alcohol, the, the wax is dissolved in the modified alcohol and the hydrocarbon, it's contained in the hydrocarbon. Best practice, uh, if you're looking to get into one of these machines or develop a, a process, 
uh, based on this technology. You need to thoroughly test and develop the process before buying equipment. This can be done by us. We have several uh, uh, machines at our applications lab, at our tech center in Nashville. Also, all of the equipment companies that I'll be showing at the end of this presentation have machines. And even if we do an initial test at Kaizen, you know, we'll, whoever, whatever equipment company you're working with, we will, you know, refer you to them and the final testing needs to be done there. But this is all easily done in the U.S. It doesn't cost, normally doesn't cost you anything unless you send us, you know, truckloads of parts. Um, but you need to clean, the, it, test the process to make sure you have proper contaminant removal, uh, good cycle times, and good compatibility with the parts uh, that you're trying to clean. Also, prior to the purchase of a vacuum degreaser, we like to get an idea as to what oils you're taking off or coolants to make sure they're compatible with this process. Uh, we've run into a number of oils over the years that contain hydrocarbon carrier solvents, and some oils can be 50% or more of these carrier solvents, which are often 140 naphtha, that have boiling points lower than 220C, and those solvents can get stuck in our cleaning solvent, and that can be a problem. Now, we'll look at your, your uh, oil or coolant ahead of time, and we can help make that decision. Uh, this process works best with, with oils that contain high solids, or in this case, as I wrote, greater than 90% non-volatile residue. And as I said, low boiling solvents can accumulate in the cleaning solvent. We need to also make sure that your contaminants are soluble in, in these uh, solvents, and that's we can do that in the lab. That's very easy to do that on the front end. Uh, we also are able to look at your at your uh, oil and coolant and see if there's any acid that might be formed. However, a little caveat, even if we don't see acid formation in our laboratory test, we will assume that you're going to produce acid, even though most machines don't. And we'll start on day one with you with a uh, acid stabilizer a test kit, and we'll teach you how to use it. And uh, we'll probably monitor your machine for the first two months just to make sure, because if you do form acid, uh, it, it could be a problem. It, hydrochloric acid, which is typically what's formed, can attack uh, stainless steel. In terms of compatibility with uh, your parts, with your substrates, this is a a, a screenshot of uh, one of our, our catalogs, and it shows some of our aqueous products on top. And the bottom two products are the, the hydrocarbon and modified alcohol. And I show this because the metal compatibility is uh, on the right, those, those final three columns. And with aqueous products, as probably most of you know, I mean, you don't, you know, you don't use a strong acid product with copper parts, for example. Uh, you need to be careful in the aqueous uh, world uh, as to what parts you're cleaning. With the hydrocarbon carbon and modified alcohol, you don't really care. I've never seen a, uh, a metal incompatibility with, uh, with either of those two products. However, you need to test polymers and elastomers. We need to make sure, and, and of course, this is usually not up to you. I mean, we work with all the equipment companies to make sure that the pump, the pump seals are made of the right materials, that valve gaskets are the right materials. But many of you, especially in aerospace and medical uh, markets, have parts which contain elastomers, Viton or, or EPDM or some other materials. And at Kaizen, we can do short and long-term testing to make sure that, uh, there, you know, we're not going to, our solvents won't swell these parts, or uh, usually what happens is there'll be a weight change or a dimensional change. So we can run those tests. Uh, it's normally not a problem, but it's always good to test and, and be sure. After you have a machine running, uh, the chemical maintenance that needs to be done after startup is uh, we'll sample and monitor for oil contaminant, um, I would say most of the time this is not necessary, but in some systems where there is a really high inflow of oil, the oil can build up in the solvent. And we, we can help you with this. Um, it, 
RP content in the RP tanks. And again, the RPs that we produce are these corrosion inhibiting waxes that are dissolved in either the hydrocarbon or the modified alcohol. Uh, that's done by an NVR test. What we found uh, in North America that is that we run this usually at three to 7% of the active RP in the solvent, 7% uh, in the summertime in Indiana or Michigan in non-air conditioned warehouses. Uh, we, we run 7%. We just never have any problems. And we'll, we'll, we'll always get more than 90, di 90 days protection, even on cast steel. But these RPs also protect uh, soft metals like aluminum and uh, brass. We need to check for acid formation in the solvent, which I mentioned earlier. It's a very easy ongoing test. And volatile foreign solvent accumulation, which I also mentioned earlier. If, you're, if you're, your oil has one of these volatile solvents, we like to check to see if, if it's accumulating. We had a machine not long ago where the customer at the end of every screw machine was dipping the parts in their baskets in 140 naphtha. And the modified alcohol in the vacuum degreaser after two years became 35% uh, hydrocarbon and we started having cleaning problems. So we like to stay on top of this. And these are things that, that we can do at Kaizen. And most of you do not have a gas chromatographs and, and we know that. So we're, it usually doesn't cost you anything and we're happy to just do, do periodic checks, just to be sure. In terms of rust prevention, as I said, these uh, the two RPs are the, the uh, wax materials dissolved in the base solvent. They do not, this process, part of the process does, does not partake in the distillation because if it, if it did, you would lose the RP. Uh, we measure the concentration of these wax materials in the solvent by doing an NVR. And those of you uh, who know about in, in non-volatile residue test, uh, in the old days, this was a sort of a 24-hour test in a hood in a lab where you evaporated the solvent away and you measured what was left. We now use these uh, really nice devices that are, are actually made for moisture analysis. The one pictured here is uh, manufactured by Mettler Toledo. And we can shorten the 24 hour test down to 30 minutes. And basically you take a, a wet sample of the solvent, which has the RP in it. You place it on a, a heated scale, push the button, which has been programmed. Uh, and in about 30 minutes, you have uh, your NVR. And then we relate percent NVR to the percentage of our CP product. And it works very well, very quick process. Again, three to seven percent is typically what we use uh, of the active R RP uh, in this in the uh, solvents. Uh, and again, do not use vapor degreasing at the end, or don't do it much because uh, you can take the RP off with that final step. These are examples at the bottom of uh, different corrosion testing we've done for our customers in our humidity chamber in Nashville. And whenever a customer asks us. And to guarantee corrosion protection, we always get their parts and simulate the process. And in 10 days, we can we can confirm that in fact we can we can give you 90 days protection. Uh, again, in the U.S., under uh, the worst conditions we have here, it's a little different in Southeast Asia, but we have those uh, parameters set also. Uh, our booster product for this is a hydrocarbon booster, which is the uh, acid stabilizer. Um, as I said earlier, this, the two solvents themselves will not turn acidic by themselves, even in the presence of moisture. However, chlorine in the U.S. is very common in North America, even more so in Asia, not so much in uh, Europe, but in Europe we see more sulfonated oils. Uh, with, with chlorine, you can produce hydrochloric acid, which under these uh, pressures and temperatures very quickly becomes a vapor. And then it permeates throughout the, the overhead of the machine, throughout the distillation hardware, the condenser, the vacuum pump, and it, it, hydrochloric acid will attack um, stainless steel. So we just need to stay on top of it. In eight years, we've never had one machine get to a point where it started to attack a machine, but, but uh, this can happen. We just stay on top of it. Um, 
This is the acid stabilizer uh, test kit for those of you who have used uh, vapor decreasers with NPB or trichloroethylene or the old days 111. This test was called the acid acceptance test. And we call it an acid stabilizer test kit. Basically, it, it's a very quick test, takes you about five minutes to run. Uh, you're combining the solvent with uh, water and you're doing extraction, doing an extraction of the acid from the solvent into the water. And then you do a titration with our, our booster. And you count the number of drops that it takes to, uh, with chlorine in the US, we like to keep the, sol the solvent at a pH of seven and higher. Normally we like the range of seven to nine. With the, sulf the sulfonated materials, if that's the only uh, uh, acid forming compound, and, we, and we're sure of that, uh, sometimes we'll let the pH drop as low as four. The problem is, is not all of our customers uh, know if, they've, if they have chlorine in their oil, if not, or not. And I will tell you, we've, been, we've worked with companies over the years who've been surprised to find out that uh, their oils did contain chlorine. So there's an equation at the bottom that you can use after you count the drops. This is kind of like uh, titration for aqueous cleaning products. And then we, we, we have charts which show you how much, in this case, it's how much ounce, how many ounces of booster to add to uh, a system of these volumes. Uh, you can take a sample from anywhere in the machine, basically. I mean, the, once the acid is formed, it permeates throughout the machine. So we tell our customers, or when we go in and we take a sample, we'll take a sample from where we have a valve, whether it's the still, the uh, solvent uh, uh, reservoir tanks themselves, or a condenser reservoir, or even sometimes the water separator. And likewise, you know, we'll add the uh, booster uh, to the system just about anywhere, because eventually the, the booster, uh, vaporizes right along with the uh, with the base solvent, and it permeates everywhere also. So it gets up into the overhead distillation process and protects everywhere, including the vacuum pump. Uh, you do not need deionized water to run this test. We 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 adjust the pH at the beginning of the test, and I point that out because early on we had some issues. And uh, I tested water around the U.S., incoming tap water, uh, even DI water was running between 4.5 and 8.5 pH. And so we, we, we developed a, a process where we actually account for that with the, with the pH adjustment at the beginning. So I've shown all of you um, these flow charts, and it's a, it's a really nice process. Uh, we have bought into it full speed. Uh, and we work with a number of vacuum degreaser uh, companies, equipment manufacturers. I'm going to show you a, a slides of eight different uh, uh, equipment manufacturers and pictures of their equipment. I'm going to spend about five seconds on each slide. There are eight companies who are actively selling now uh, in the U.S. and we have chemistry uh, in equipment made by all of these companies. They're all solid. I mean, I'll be honest, we, we almost never have equipment problems in this part of our business. In alphabetical order, Chemistears, they, it, it, by the way, these companies are, are, general, are all in either Italy or uh, Germany. And so all of the machines being used now in the U.S. are imported. Chemistears based in Italy. Uh, they have representation in the U.S. They make very nice uh, vacuum degreasing equipment. Echo Clean, uh, formerly Dürr, is based uh, in Germany as well. Uh, they have their own operation uh, in uh, Southfield, Michigan, near near Detroit. Uh, all of these companies, by the way, uh, and Echo Clean in particular, have a nice application labs where you can do testing. Ferbomatic is an Italian company also has a representation in the US. Uh, James Carroll out of Florida represents them. Um, very nice vacuum degreasing equipment, uh, mostly modified alcohol. Hawk, I never say that word right. Hawk is a uh, uh, manufacturer from Germany and they also have representation in the US. 
IFP is uh, based in Italy. They are represented in the United States by Gossiger High Volume out of Dayton, Ohio. Very nice equipment, very solid as all of these are. And they also have testing capabilities uh, uh, out of Dayton, Ohio. Ilsem is a Itali Italian company, again, uh, now represented by Alliance Manufacturing out of uh, Wisconsin. Very nice, very nice equipment, uh, vacuum decreasing, using mostly modified alcohol, but some hydrocarbon. Pero is a German company based in, uh, in Germany, the US, their, their own US operation is in Windsor, Connecticut. Uh, we have modified alcohol and hydrocarbon running in, in these machines in the US. Roll is a German company who do very nice equipment, uh, vacuum degreasing and, and water-based. They're represented by JCOM Import out of Indianapolis. Again, all of these companies make solid equipment and they have test machines uh, in the US. So the last few slides, uh, just to show again, some of these parts, and I've been doing this since 1979 and cleaning. And these, all of you know who have done this for a while, these are just miserable parts to clean. But this process does a great job. It really does a nice job. And you can stack, you have higher stacking heights than you normally would um, for parts. There, These machines are all very solid, very automated, and they're very good at, at passing millipore uh, particulate specs internal threads, external threads. The, you can see the baskets normally have uh, spring-loaded lids. So even if you have external threads and you're rotating the parts uh, 360, the threads are not being damaged in most cases. Uh, or it could be fixtured if they are, but it works very well for external threads, small internal holes. Uh, again, we've gotten into, in the last 10 years, we have gotten heavily into automotive, which is probably it's the biggest market we're in, in uh, vacuum degreasing, medical uh, implants uh, and insertion devices. And again, our, our modified alcohol passes, uh, biotoxicity, the cyto, uh, in vitro cytotoxicity test, bio, biocompatibility um, for, in, for all of those components, precision cleaning for bearings, for, for watch components, very small parts that are otherwise very difficult to clean. Aerospace operations, so this is growing rapidly within the aerospace market. We now have several customers uh, in this market. In summary, why vacuum degreasing? And so for my, this was my real uh, summary page, excellent cleaning choice for a wide range of soils, contaminants, again, ability to clean and dry parts without separating them continuous removal of contaminants uh, from the cleaning solvent. So you're constantly cleaning the solvent, you're constantly removing the contaminant from the cleaning process. And the uh, operator is isolated from the process. So, so it's very safe, the limit, very limited chemical exposure. Uh, the vacuum produces that isolation. It also, by the way, lowers the oxygen uh, level in the machine so we don't have a fire hazard with these products. And again, and I highlight this one because this is so important that there's no water used in these machines. It's a very small amount of water that you remove from the uh, uh, water separator, but very, very small. And Lori, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Great, thanks for the helpful presentation, Chuck. Our first question is, uh, will basket rotation damage parts? Uh, no, not, and uh, not normally the parts can be fixtured. And, I, and I've actually seen small baskets placed inside big baskets. I mean, for those of you who've been in aqueous cleaning, it's, it's similar, similar to that. Uh, we just fixture the parts or basket the parts so that we don't have damage with these compression lids. This is a batch cleaning process. Can the basket movement be automated? Yes, and I would say at least half of the machines, if not more than half that I see are highly automated uh, the, with, with automated uh, uh, conveyor systems that move the, the baskets in and out of the process. All right. 
how long will the CP81 and the CP86 protect my parts? Uh, again, at 7%, and we, we like to key on uh, cast steel, which as most of you probably know is, is a more difficult protection issue than with uh, mild steel. We'll normally get 90 days plus in the U.S. at 7%. And I, I didn't add, I didn't comment, but I will now. The film that's left on these parts is dry and it's invisible. Okay. Go ahead. Where does the CP left on the tank walls go? So there's a little bit, it's an interesting question. There's a little bit of uh, CP left in the process because you, during the start of the next cleaning cycle, then you just can't purge the tanks completely. So just a very small amount does get removed. It's treated as contaminant or soil uh, by the, by the uh, wash stage or the first step of the next cleaning process and that is eventually removed uh, through the distillation. Okay. Can I coat the baskets rather than use inserts? You can, um, and we're in, we're in a number of systems with coated baskets. We just, again, these are solvents. We just need to make sure that your coating is compatible with these solvents. And we've done this for a number of customers where we'll take a baskets that you're looking to use and we'll do, you know, we could do, we could do, Long-term protection, we usually like to run at least 10 days. Um, but we'll, if, if we don't already have those tests done for, you know, PVC or, or whatever, whatever type of uh, polyurethane coating that you're going to use, we can test it um, and make sure. Okay. Is the corrosion inhibitor film on the parts wet or dry? It is dry. When these, when these parts dry completely, which they're they're dry when they come out of the machine. It's a dry film and it's in most, most cases, it's an invisible film. Okay. If I am continually adding solvent along with the CP and booster blends, won't I overfill my system? Uh, that, it's a good question. Normally not. I, and I, I can't think of any machine that we're in where we're actually purposely removing solvent. So even though we do that, do add a very small amount of solvent with the CP, again, there's material that's left on the walls of the, you know, of the process chamber. It's so small that, that, that even those machines do require a makeup. Um, and, and I didn't mention this, but by the way, you know, we're in over, well over a hundred machines and the average consumption small machine to big machine per year is about one and a half drums. So compare that to, you know, an aqueous process. We have many machines that are running a drum a week. So very efficient use of cleaning chemistry. Okay. How do, how well do these alcohols remove small particles? For example, one micrometer or smaller? Uh, you know, a lot of that depends on the, not to give you a cagey answer here, but a lot of it depends on the parts and how they're fixtured and the ultrasonics. And, and uh, uh, I think in many cases we're able to meet those requirements. We will rely on the equipment manufacturer to run those tests. Um, they, all of these equipment manufacturers have, have uh, Millipore apparatus with the digital microscopes. And I will say that this is a very nice, you know, relative to the other cleaning up uh, processes that are available, this is a very, efficient and effective way to remove very small particulate. Okay. I see how the vapor can remove oil from blind holes. How well are particles removed from blind holes? Well, uh, the liquid actually removes the particles from blind holes in this process. Okay. So this is not a vapor degreasing process, even though there's a vapor degreasing step. This is not like the old vapor degreaser where we're relying on a vapor degreasing to clean. Uh, some of the machines now do have a vapor degreasing step at the beginning, and they will remove, you know, in some cases, a, a large portion of the of the oil and, and other contaminant. But for removing particles from blind holes, you know, we do that with ultrasonics in this process in the liquid uh, cleaning part of the operation, normally with rotation of the parts. Okay. So that's all the questions we have for today. We hope you found this helpful. And now on behalf of the Parts Cleaning Conference and our sponsor, Kaizen Corp, 
Thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.